these are the lecture notes for chapter 29 on vertebrates. So, um, first of all, you need to understand that the animals in this chapter are all in the same animal phylum called the phylum chordata. We call them the chordates. Most of them are also vertebrates, but not all. There are chordates that don't have a true backbone that don't, or that don't have a backbone. So for the phylum chordata, all of them have these four characteristics in common. And that is that all of them have a notochord, at least the presence of a notochord. A notochord is a dorsal supporting rod located below the nerve cord. So in most chordates, the notochord becomes the bony vertebrae that surround the spinal nerve, the spinal cord. But some chordates, the notochord just remains a supporting rod. It doesn't form into vertebrae. So anyway, the phylum chordata all have a notochord. All of them have a dorsal tubular nerve cord. Remember, um, that the uh, earthworm had a uh, ventral solid nerve cord. So all of the chordates have a dorsal tubular nerve cord. We call it our spinal cord. And almost all of them, that nerve cord is protected by a vertebrae. All the chordates have pharyngeal pouches, which become gills and aquatic vertebrates. And then they're modified into other structures in the throat area and the ear area for other chordates. Then um, all chordates have a post-anal tail. That is a tail that extends beyond the anus. In humans, that tail is there in the early embryonic stages, but then it disappears. So this is what a typical chordate embryo would look like. And you can see all four characteristics. And this is what a human embryo would look like early, early, early on. Um, a lot of people don't realize that the human embryo has a post-anal tail, but it, the humans do not have tails. So it, um, the cells that form that tail undergo apoptosis early in development and the, the tail, um, basically disappears. We have a vestigial tail, um, but humans do not have tails. The notochord is seen here in red. The dorsal tubular nerve cord is in blue attached to the head region. And then you can see the pharyngeal pouches here. So those are the four characteristics. Make sure you know that all chordates have those four characteristics. Now, the first two chordates are not vertebrates. They're called lancelets and sea squirts. The lancelets are um, their scientific name or their, their scientific group is the cephalochordates. They, are, they live in shallow marine environments. They are filter feeders and they are segmented. Then you have the sea squirts or tunicates, and they are in the group called urochordates. Um, they are also marine. They are also filter feeders. Um, and you can see a picture here of the lancelets. And then you can see a picture of the tunicates. The picture on the left is not great, but um, then you see an illustration on the right. And although they don't, uh, the sea squirts don't look like much, they are, they do have bilateral symmetry. Now this, this um, phylogenetic tree shows all of the chordates that we're going to learn. We've already covered the lancelets and the tunicates. Then we're going to start with all of the vertebrates, which will, will begin with the jawless fishes, the cartilaginous fishes, the ray finned fishes, the lobe finned fishes, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. All right, section 29.2, the vertebrates. So all of these animals do have a backbone. They're in the phylum chordata, and they are vertebrates because they have a vertebral column that replaces the notochord. They also have a skull, and they have an endoskeleton. 
And this just kind of shows you some um, illustrations so you can understand replacing the notochord with vertebrae. You can see in the picture on the left, here is a cross section so that you can see the, the neural tube is the nerve cord. Um, and then the notochord that supports it is underneath it. And that, you would see that in lancelets and sea squirts. And then over here on the right, you see a ver uh, one uh, vertebra that is surrounding that nerve cord. The, the spinal cord would be in here, and then the bones that surround it are the vertebrae. Um, now, uh, going back to the vertebrae, uh, to the vertebrates, the ones that have jaws are called nathostomes. That G is silent, nathostomes. So all of the vertebrates that have jaws are called nathostomes. That term includes the jawed fishes and all the um, yeah it, it the nathostomes include the jawed fishes okay and then um, which is like the the uh, ones that have cartilage and the ones that have bones but it does not include what we call the agnathans which are the jawless fishes. And then a, um, a lot of the vertebrates are tetrapods, meaning they have four limbs. The amphibians are the first tetrapods. They evolved from bony fishes. And we should probably talk about the, this word fishes. So fish, F-I-S-H, can be used singular and plural. If I am referring to one fish, then I say fish. If I'm referring to two fish of the same species, two or more fish of the same species, then I still say fish. But when I begin referring to more than one species of fish, then I use the word fishes. Fishes, just by its definition, means more than one species of fish. So the fishes in the aquarium um, at uh, Atlantic Beach, that aquarium, that big aquarium in that area, um, we would say the fishes because they have many species of fish in that aquarium. So the fishes are the largest group of vertebrates. They are, of course, they're aquatic and they have gills. They usually have fins and scales, but we're going to start with the jawless fishes or agnathans. That's like a, a, um, using the word nathostome and putting an A in front of it means without jaws. Okay, agnathans are the jawless fishes, and they include the lampreys and the hagfishes. And they don't have a bony skeleton. This is a picture of a lamprey, and you can see that it has this sucker region. Um, it's a parasite of other fish. You may have seen it attached to... Um, other fish. It does have gill slits. Then we're going to move on to the jawed fish. Fishes with jaws are ectothermic. They have gills. They either have a skeleton of cartilage or bone, and they have scales. The cartilaginous fishes are the class chondroichthyes. Chondra means cartilage, ichthyes means fish. So the chondroichthyes are the cartilaginous fishes. They include the sharks, rays, skates, and the chimeras. And they lack a gill cover, so you just can see their gills. They don't have a covering over their gills. Of course, this is a tiger shark. This is a stingray. And then we have the um, bony fishes or osteichthyes. That means bony fish. Oste osteo means bone and ichthyes means fish. So the bony fishes are divided into the ray finned bony fishes and the lobe finned. Um, but most of them are ray finned fishes. So um, they have an operculum which covers their gills, unlike the um, sharks and the rays. 
and the skates. They have an operculum that covers their gills. They have a swim bladder, which helps them with buoyancy in the water. They can fill it up and they'll float higher in the water or more near the surface, or they can release air from it and then they'll sink further down. So it helps them with the, the um, a, where, they're, where they're able to float in the water. Um, and most of them undergo external fertilization, mean, meaning that the, the female fish lays the eggs and the male fish comes by and sprays sperm over top of the eggs. Um, what we're seeing here is a lionfish, which is an invasive species. Um, and then we're seeing a seahorse. These are all bony ray finned fishes. Um, you got a soldier fish in the illustration at the top. Then the lionfish, the seahorse, the flying fish, and the swordfish. Then we're going to move on to the lobe finned fishes, and their fins are more fleshy, more muscular, um, and supported by these thick bones that are um, similar to the bones in the human arms and legs. So the lobe finned fishes include the lung fishes and the coelacanths, and they, they um, did give rise to the amphibians. So here we see a coelacanth, and you can see how its fins are more fleshy, more lobe, um, lobes rather than rays. Uh, there are some lobed fin, lobe finned fishes that can actually walk a little bit on land um, if the water dries up or in their habitat. All right, then we have amphibians, which evolved from the lobe-finned fishes. The amphibians are tetrapods for the most part, meaning they have four limbs. They have smooth, non-scaly skin. They breathe with lungs, but their lungs are reduced, so the amphibians also must supplement their breathing through their skin. They have a double loop circulatory pathway with a three-chambered heart. Now, up until now, the fishes only have a two-chambered heart. You can see here that their heart just consists of one atrium, which receives blood, and one ventricle, which pumps blood. And basically, the blood flows past the gills, then the rest of the body, and comes back to the heart. Goes to the gills, rest of the body, back to the heart. It's a single circuit. But starting with the amphibians, we have a double circuit. We have the blood. Well, first of all, we have two atria and one ventricle. The blood from each atrium mixes in the ventricle. The ventricle pumps the blood to the lungs and the skin to receive oxygen, comes back to the heart, and then gets pumped to the rest of the body, and then back to the heart again. So starting with the amphibians, we have a double loop circulatory system, a three chambered heart, and then moving on into the mammals, we have four chambered heart. The amphibians are ectothermic like fish. They are, have aquatic reproduction. They reproduce in the water and it is external. Um, and they do undergo metamorphosis. The examples of the amphibians are the salamanders and the newts, which practice internal fertilization rather than external. That means they release the sperm inside the female's body. But the frogs and toads and chysalians all have external fertilization, where the male fertilizes the eggs outside the female's body. And, of course, external development. So the frogs and the toads do not have tails. The chysalians don't have legs and they're blind. So we have here a salamander, a frog, and a chysalian, which looks like a worm, but is not. And then there's medical use of animals. I don't really know anything besides what I'm seeing in the pictures, but I know they use snake venom um, to make antivenin. Anti which is used if someone gets bitten by a poisonous snake. And then um, goats, of course, they're used for their milk. Um, and then a pig heart. Um, we, we use pig valves to replace um, human valves when a person needs a valve replacement. In fact, I know a lady who's getting one. Uh, now we're going to move on to the reptiles, which are class reptilia. 
They have paired limbs, thick scaly skin that is impermeable to water. They have efficient breathing, efficient lungs now, so they don't supplement their breathing through their skin. Um, they have efficient circulation, and they have a, one ventricle, which is partially or completely divided by a septum. When you get into the crocodiles and the alligators, they have um, a divider, so they practically have two ventricles. Um, the oxygenated blood and the deoxygenated blood is not mixed. So it's almost like having four, a four-chambered heart in the uh, crocodiles and the alligators. But uh, most of them just have a divided ventricle, so we still say they have a three-chambered heart, technically. They are, rep reptiles are ectothermic, and they um, practice internal fertilization, and for the most part, external development. They do lay eggs um, most, most of the time, with a few exceptions. This is the an anatomy of um, a crocodile or an alligator. I, I'm pretty sure it's an alligator. And then um, starting with this next section, we're going to talk about the evolution of the amniotes. That means the animals that lay amniotic eggs and the amniotes begin with the reptiles were the first amniotes. So we will um, start here in the next recording.